Hi, and welcome to John Brink's interview series on his new book, Against All Odds. I'm Veronica Beltran, and you and I will sit through the next 10 episodes getting to know all about John, from where he came from to where he's at now and everything in between. All right, John, so today we're talking about your book, Against All Odds. Odds. Now I had the opportunity to read it from you know the start to the very very finish, and I must say like I was really inspired by it. Yeah. Um, but I would love to know like what what inspired you to sit down, take the time to write to write a book about your entire life. Yeah, I actually been thinking about it for a long time, probably more than twenty years, maybe, maybe even longer than that, and at times made an attempt to kind of lay down what my experiences were. Uh, you know, from the time that I came to Canada in 1965. And, uh, and then I started and then I stopped and then I started, stopped again. And then as life went on and it became more interesting, mm -hmm. on and on again, I w became a bit more serious about it. At one point, I hired somebody to help me with how the process worked. And, uh, and then finally, after all this time, uh, two years ago, I engaged another company uh, that uh, Echo Storytelling out of Vancouver actually, who did a very good job for us uh, helping it with the whole structure around it because it's complicated writing sure. a book, not just the writing, but everything around it. Mm -hmm. So then uh, engage them and then uh, two years later, we have a finished product. Will you look at that. Now, now you're saying it was like a, it was a stop and go progress, right? Uh, creating this book. Why did it take you, I guess, so long to write it or 30 years to finally talk about it? It took me so long for a, a number of reasons. Some of them we will talk a bit later about, but, uh, uh, you know, the other things took over where I became busy or all of a sudden I lost the inspiration to do that at that particular point and then kind of stopped. It, it's quite an amazing process to, uh, you know, be deeply engaged in it and do it in such a way that it's just not a story, but it is more like an interesting story to others. You know? When you're going through, um, through your book, you know, when I went through your book, there's a lot of ups and a lot of downs. Was it hard to write about what you wrote, your, your life? It was hard about uh, that, uh, uh, Veronica, in, in terms of, uh, you know, the, uh, th there have been some really trying times, as you know, from the, uh, from the book. And uh, uh, yeah, it was uh, difficult sometimes in a way, but on the other hand, to me, it was extremely important to write about not just the good time, but also about the challenges that came along the way. And, uh, you know, it's not just a biography that tells me from the time that it started to where it, it came to and, and uh, but to include all the things that were challenges and I'm sure we'll get into some of those as we go further into our interviews. Uh, so uh, yeah, I, I'm happy about that I did it and that I included everything uh, that happened along the way. Now, I guess you said, you know, you had to share the good times and, and you wanted to share the bad times as well, which I guess is like, there's a sense of vulnerability there. Was that hard for you to get over? Like, oh my gosh, people are going to read this, you know? Yeah, in a, in a way, yes, indeed, you know. So not, not after the 20 years that I had been working on it and, and, and contemplating some of these things, as I became older, you know, and uh, I just turned 80 actually about a couple of weeks ago. And, uh, oh. you know, so... Uh, Happy belated. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, some of those things to me uh, are even more important now in terms of not so much of talking about me, but about others that maybe deal with some issues that I had to deal with that have some stigma attached to it maybe, or, uh, you know, showing that you know, you can fall down, then rise again, and all those things. So it became, in fact, something that I had an obligation to do, to write about. Now, seeing you, you, you went through all those struggles, but now you have like this empire and this legacy that you mm. will leave behind. Um, what is it that you hope people take away from, from reading your book? Very interesting question. What, what I believe, what I'm hoping they will take from it is that, as, as the title says, against all odds, that no matter how tough it gets, you know, uh, you stay the course and you will succeed. You know. 
perfect. I like yeah. that. Yeah. Well, that's what I was inspired to do after I read it too. I was like, yeah. I can do anything. Anything. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, okay. Without giving too much away, what are some of the highlights people can expect from this book? Some of the highlights uh, they can show that uh, you know that. Uh, uh, will be one and, and in fact the next book that we're going to write is about that particular topic is I'm a classic ADHD you know and, and uh, uh, that is well described in the book and, uh, uh, and it's a topic that to a lot of people and, and young people and even some older people uh, have stigma still now attached to it. In fact I met an individual on Saturday that is extremely successful uh, you know, and, and has good businesses. The person is 52 years old. That is just on Saturday that as we were sitting there talking about a project he's doing for me in, uh, the low, uh, in, uh, on Vancouver Island, uh, he, he opened up about uh, ADHD and he is still struggling with that today in terms of the stigma and, and other things around it. And uh, so it, uh, to me it was... Uh, 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 quite an experience to talk to him about it and he saw he sent me an email actually on Monday and and said uh, you know but he got out of it was something that he was still struggling with and he enjoyed talking to me about what I had gone through about it and how I feel about it uh, you know and, and what I talk about a little bit more likely or whenever you wish uh, is that in fact uh, it's not a liability, it's an asset, you know, so, uh, and, and, you know, so that type of thing. So that are some of the things. And then, uh, you know, starting from the bottom up where you uh, land in a country like Canada, you don't, you can't speak the language, you don't have a job and you don't know a soul, right? Yeah. So, and, uh, you know, so those were uh, a dream come through on the one side and on the other hand, uh, you know, okay, where do you go now, you know, so. Right. No, exactly. And yeah. you're not originally from, from Canada as well. And you touch on that throughout your book. You actually experienced a little bit of, uh, of the war, the Second World War. Um, I was born in 1940, at the beginning of the war. And then, uh, you know, we were liberated in the hometown where I'm from in northern Holland uh, on April the 12th, 1945. And I pretty much remember a lot about the time that I was three and a half, four years old and five years old. So, and... We talk about that in the book as well. Yeah, you, you definitely do. And definitely a good read. I think I was on maybe I, the sixth page, third page even, I think it was. It was pretty early on and I was like in tears, you know, some of the things that you, you saw and you lived yeah. through. PTSD, you know, so yeah. For yeah. sure. And that's something very, that... Very real. You know, so, oh, for sure. That's yeah. something that you still continue to... To a certain extent, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, like, uh, you know, the PTSD is very much part of that, yeah. But but it, it is something different than ADHD. ADHD, uh, and I can talk about it quite a bit, but I won't do it at this particular moment, but it's something that you are likely, and I don't use the right technology, uh, uh, terminology likely, but that you have as you were born, and then from then, other people may say not so, but once you have it, it's not something that you can kind of medically take away or, or have counseling and then fix it. No, it's that's you. You're an ADHD person, in my belief. PTSD is because of trauma of some sort or another. And, and, and uh, counseling has a bit of stigma to it as well because tough guys don't go to mm -hmm. counselors, right? So right. I, I, I don't believe in that. I believe in counseling and uh, it certainly helped me, you know, so... For sure, for sure. So we go through, you go through so much in your book. Like it was honestly, like it's, it's just, it, it left me in awe seeing, you know, you, you survived, well, you, you survived the war because you had a near death experience, which we won't talk about right now, but we'll get to when yeah. we do talk about chapter one. And you had several near death experiences throughout yeah, the entire book. I, I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> like, yeah. you know, you, you survived, you made it. Yeah. And now you're here today. So um, this really <laughs> is an, a super inspiring book. And, and I have to say, I, because I was so, I left so inspired by it. Will you be producing more books in the future? Yes, I will, yeah. I intend to write one, one book per year from here on in. In fact, we already are working towards, uh, you know, the, the next book. We know what it uh, will be about. It will be about living and experiencing HDAD. 
and, and uh, dealing with people in your family that happen and all things around it. That uh, will be the next book. Lastly, I wanted to touch a little bit because I thought this was quite interesting. You just said that you turned 80 years old, but you also mentioned in your book, uh, you don't have to go too much in, in depth about this, but uh, you mentioned bodybuilding yeah. and competitions. And I think that that was just such an extraordinary part because it's totally different from all the things that you did do throughout your book. And, yeah. you know, talk a little bit about that. Uh, probably something that, you know, I, I didn't live as clean as I could have do up to about 2008, meaning that uh, I didn't eat as healthy as I could have. And my wife is very uh, healthy oriented and, uh, you know, and I didn't, I, I was not abusive, but uh, I was not healthy. <laughs> yes. Know? So, uh, and uh, then... Uh, I got an, uh, you know, uh, an, a case of uh, diverticulitis, uh, you know, that uh, is where your large uh, uh, colon uh, ruptures and, and toxins fill in your, and very dangerous, uh, you know, you, you have about 48 hours before it starts attacking your organs. organs. And uh, so uh, I came about that close to uh, not making. So that, uh, I think in about three or four weeks, I lost about 30 pounds, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, and then, uh, you know, that kind of motivated me to go to the gym in earnest, you know, like we all have gone, oh, I'm going to go to the gym and we buy a membership and we go a couple of times and then we don't. Yeah. You know? So then I did in earnest and then from there and then I started working with the trainer and then from there and then we'll talk about it more later, likely it came to the point that somebody said, uh, Hey, you ever thought about going uh, in competition? You said me? You know, where people, you know, people start recognizing you are changing and you're saying, you look pretty good. You know, some of the people around the gym and, and then the next thing you look in and you start flexing a little bit and you say, <laughs> well, you know, and then all of a sudden you become more serious about it. And I, I engaged a good trainer and, uh, you know, before you know it, I was, uh, uh, we have uh, an annual competition here, the Iron Ore and, uh, you know, the... Uh, so I, I signed up for that and uh, quite intimidating you know, because then I'm standing in my little speedos in front of all the, all the people that I know and flexing and all of that. So I got through that and then I came in second on bodybuilding, third in physique that qualified me for the provincials and I came in the other way around, third in uh, bodybuilding, second in physique and that qualified me for the nationals and the Arnolds, you know, so mm -hmm. it made, and so I, at that time I think it was 78, you know, so it made me pretty much the oldest bodybuilder, wow. uh, competitive bodybuilder mm -hmm. in uh, British Columbia. And Are you planning on competing again? That's interesting that you asked me that because, uh, you know, I was at Gold's today uh -huh. and I signed up again for, uh, you know, going back into training, which I probably will start next week. And I intend to compete again, uh, if not in 21, then in 22, you know, which will make me the year that I turn 82. Wow. And, and uh, I want to again qualify for the Nationals. Oh, wow. Oh, my goodness. Well, I'm sure you will do it. I believe in you. You can do anything. You know, you've been through so much. Yeah. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to say that I that I haven't asked you? No, you know, the uh, you know, the, my foundation is what I believe in deeply is an attitude, passion, work ethic. Combine those three. Success will follow. And, and so uh, what I do is uh, I usually get up early at 5.30 every morning and uh, I get up. When I get up, I think I'm late already. <laughs> so I'm always in a hurry because, uh, you know, and that has been that way since I was virtually a kid. And, uh, you know, and then I always make my bed. I always make my bed. The reason that I do that is because it gives me a good feeling uh, before I walk out of bed and I look back to my bed, it's all night. If it is not quite right, I was also in the in the Air Force, and <laughs> your bed is very important that it is all. Right. So I straighten out, just make sure it's all good. And then uh, in the evening when I come home, usually, uh, you know, around 7 o'clock or whatever, I'm usually at work for uh, at least 12 hours a, a, a day. And, uh, you know, then, uh, you know, I watch a little bit of news and then uh, get something to eat. And then from there, and, and, you know, and go to bed and get ready for you know, in this beautiful made-up bed and go to sleep. You know, so that's why I do it. Makes me feel good. Yeah, For so. sure.
Yeah. Agreed, agreed. And you just said 12 hour days, right? It hasn't changed one bit for you. You know, you're still you're still spending lots of time at work, just like you did when you first started, right? And when I first started, I stayed at work as long as I could stay awake, yeah. you know, at least 100, 120 hours a week. Yeah, seven days a week. Yeah. But that's what it takes, right? That, whatever it takes, that's what it, uh, it's, it's sometimes, uh, you know, people think that entrepreneurs that appear to be successful, you know, that their pre, pri, primary uh, preoccupation is planning holidays and bringing money to the bank. It isn't. On the other hand, if you do it well and you're willing to make the commitments and your family know what are, are with you, then the rewards can be very rewarding. But, uh, you know, the, it, it, uh, it is demanding and, uh, you know, the, uh, you have to have the, the mentality for it, you know, because it can involve uh, falling down, standing up, falling on. And, and it can be very taxing on the family from time to time. Of course, which actually brings me to a follow-up question here. Uh, you do talk about, throughout your book, you know, we have like your family pops up here and there, yeah. right? Um, Talk a little bit about uh, the struggles that you face throughout this book, throughout your life with yeah. family. Yeah, obviously they are very important to me, and uh, you know the uh, in my I have two daughters, and they are uh, married to very good uh, you know uh, men, or uh, you know, and I've known them for a long time, and so they are very good. Uh, uh, one of uh, my oldest daughter, uh, Nicole, she's an architect, and uh, but very active in uh, in her family life right now mm -hmm. but uh, and then her husband Ian Ian argue uh, you know he's a, a CFA very highly qualified uh, has been an internet and worked internationally he's an incoming CEO to the company uh, in in time and then my younger daughter uh, uh, Tina uh, they have both a, a boy girl uh, you know the uh, all below 10 years old uh, uh, she is uh, a teacher, has a master's in education. She's uh, married to Cooper Mears, who uh, is a pilot. You know, that's not very good right now. <laughs> Obviously, he's a, he, flow, he was flying uh, uh, 737s for West yet. So, but I'm proud of all of them. Yeah, good, so, good. yeah. But uh, my question, hold on, let me just rephrase. Um, um, can you talk a little bit about the struggles you faced with your family during your life, you know, trying to balance work and, and family? I'm sure, you know, pulling 14, 16 hour days probably had a little bit of an impact. Yeah, well, there's no question about it. Uh, I was married, uh, you know, the, uh, the first time I was married uh, in Watson Lake, Yukon. Can you believe it? Uh, you know, be, uh, the justice of the peace, it cost $5 and it took 20 minutes. And then I had a motel and a, and a bar and, uh, you know, and then, uh, you know, within 15 minutes or so, uh, we were married and paid the $5 to the justice of the peace and I was back at work. And uh, Eve, my first wife, uh, we, we separated in 1983, but uh, still have a good relationship. But, uh, you know, the, uh, it was extremely demanding on, on the family, yeah. For sure. No doubt about it. And lastly, I just want to touch on, um, you know, going back to what we said before about some of the hardships, you know, the good times and the bad times. There was a period there in your life where it just kind of seemed all bad, at least from what I was reading, you know, with um, uh, the lawsuit, with the fraud in the forestry industry. Talk yeah. a little bit about that. Not too in-depth, but... No, no. <laughs> yeah. It was one of those things that happened, uh, Veronica, where you sometimes what happens is that circumstances occur that all of a sudden you become knowledgeable about something that is not right and that's what started the fraud around the, the, the lawsuit it was here locally the grading rule deals with lumber lumber that is manufactured is sorted into different grades mm -hmm. The high grades are used in structures like this and must meet certain criteria of strength. And, uh, you know, and I found out that, and that's all very, very much controlled by government agency and other agencies that make sure that it meets the quality standards. Mm -hmm. And what I found out on August the 5th, 1986 at 10 o'clock in the morning, 
I can still stand there within a foot. I've been in the industry my whole life, even uh, since 1965 here, but before that even in Holland, when I was 14, 15 years old, I started working in a lumber manufacturing plant or furniture plant initially. But in any event, I found out that there are in existence two sets of rules, the one far less restrictive than the other. Mm -hmm. If the quality standard is here, that one was much lower. Right. And it was secret and confidential. I thought that was not right. Mm -hmm. Neither mm -hmm. did other people, but everybody was scared to say something about it. Right, but you did, right? I did. And I had, I thought it was reg local. Yeah. And then I thought it was regional. Mm -hmm. Then I found out, it was, then I thought it was Can uh, NBC. And then I thought it was Canada. It was a practice that had gone on for nearly 20 years in North America, from Florida to California, from Labrador to Alaska, and made multi millions, if not billions of dollars. And I litigated that uh, uh, in, in the Supreme Court for 60 days. Yeah. I was boycotted where I could get no more raw material and, uh, you know, lost virtually everything that I had. I only had one lawyer. Mm -hmm. uh, there were probably 14 lawyers on the other side. Right. And the reason that it is, I say 14 lawyers, there were probably three or four that were working on the case, but because it involved so many other jurisdictions, mm -hmm. they became interveners that had a vested interest in the outcome of the lawsuit. Right. And, uh, but I had the one lawyer and then uh, I had never been in a courtroom in my life, never, ever. And uh, being in cross-examination for uh, you know, seven days by the best lawyers that money can buy. And, uh, you know, so, but I won the lawsuit. Damn. And it changed all the grading rules in North America. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, what happens around lawsuits like that, where there is so much at stake, multi-billion dollars at stake, uh, you know, I uh, had a period of six arsons at, uh, you know, a couple of pieces of equipment, my sawmill that I had, an Damn. attempt on my... Uh, uh, dry kilns and then an, an attempt on my house you know so <laughs> well it takes a strong person to be able to you know handle all of that for sure uh, 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 obviously what was happening and I'm not pointing fingers at anybody mm -hmm. who did it but if you have these last massive cases massive yeah. cases then there are sympathizers in some form or fashion that want to help whatever Others are for whatever reason, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, and, and uh, it was fairly obvious that it was critically important to break down John Brink and his resistance. Uh, you know, and uh, uh, you know, they they came close several times. You know, so. But you, you did make a change, and that's really what this book is all about. You know, although we do see those really low, low points in your life, we also see those beautiful, beautiful highs, and we see sure. how well you're doing now, right? Uh, so I look forward to chatting with you a little bit more about your book, Chapter One, in our uh, next episode here. Thank so, you. Yeah.